Well, a, a big welcome during the during this difficult time. And it's lovely to see you all uh, attending this this uh, lovely special evening. And we're very very lucky to have with us Keshe Namdak. And for those of you who are not familiar with Keshe Valda Namdak, I just will give you a little bit about his background. And particularly as it's being recorded, so it means that those who do sort of log on. So I'm going to be a little bit perhaps longer with the introduction than it would normally be, but it means people will know who he is and what he's done. Um, our speaker, uh, Venerable Geshe Tenzin Namdak, he first worked as an environmental researcher, uh, having graduated in hydrology. And he comes from, the, as you know, from the Netherlands. And of course, you know, water, dams and so on is very important in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but but you can see it's very practical, you know, feet on the ground to background. He started studying Buddhism at the Maitreya Institute in the Netherlands in 93 and took ordination from His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, before engaging in formal studies in Buddhist philosophy and psychology at Sarah J. Monastic University in 1997. And he completed the first entire 20-year Geshe program at Sarajaya in 2017 and the traditional one-year Vajrayana study program in Gyume Tantric College in January 2019 and the first Westerner to do so. Geshe Namdak was a founding teacher of Sarajay Translators Program and member of Sarajay's Education Department for six years and was one of the founding trustees and teachers um, at the FPMT Center that teaches the Nalanda tradition of Buddhism in Bangalore and the first director of Shedrup Sungjal Ling, a house for Western monks studying at Sarajay for 15 years. He's received a great number of teachings from His Holiness and many other highly respected teachers and lineages masters. He has done many retreats and is an experienced teacher in practical and philosophical aspects of Buddhism that he teaches with great clarity, good sense of humor. And so he's currently the resident teacher at Jamyang Buddhist Center, London, and teaches also at other centers in Europe and in India. And I can hardly think of really of a more qualified person to be speaking to us. He has his feet in the Tibetan tradition, in the Western tradition, as by the foundation in natural sciences, and in philosophy of Buddhism, and has many, many years of study behind him. But uh, tonight's talk is the mind and its ultimate nature. Um, so, but before we just before we begin, I would say that on Thursday, the 4th of June, there's going to be a little symposium from two in the afternoon till four on Buddhism and the environment. And Geshe Namdak will be with us then, Venerable Suchita from the Theravada tradition, and also Colin Ash. Colin Ash is a long-term member of Amravati and he's also an economist. And so that, that's a, it'll be a lovely afternoon and you're all most welcome to, to come and join us then. So, so please do. And so without further ado, we will start our, our talk and a very, very big welcome. Geshe, lovely to see you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Desmond, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I was, what Desmond said, uh, started as a Westerner in ordinary life as a university student, and then became interested into spirituality, so to say, and that took part in the direction of Buddhism. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that caused me actually to hang, yeah, to stay in a big monastic institution for about two decades, a little bit over two decades. So yeah. Um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about aspect of the mind. Yeah, as you know, the Buddhist doctrine or you know, the teachings of the Buddha uh, talks about mind science yeah, or psychology and different aspects of philosophy. They will help us to understand aspects of the mind as well as what the mind is perceiving, yeah, the world around us. So the Buddhist teachings are extremely elaborate. Yeah, as you, behind me, you can probably see there's... Uh, Texts, this kind of text in the Tibetan language, which is translated from Sanskrit. So the tradition where we come from, uh, following the guidance of Solon's Dalai Lama, is basically a tradition that is not a Tibetan-made tradition, right? It's a tradition that is based on the Nalanda tradition of India, 
Yeah, so a tradition of, you know, from the old uh, monastic universities like Nalanda, Vikramashila, Takshila, uh, where the Buddhism was being studied many, many centuries after the Buddha's passing. Yeah, so that tradition came to Tibet and all the texts got translated into Tibetan language and yeah, a few of those kind of texts are <laughs> behind me. So now this month, so to say, is the holy month of uh, Buddha's birth and uh, most of you probably know Buddha's birth and uh, enlightenment and uh, Parnivana. So that's a very auspicious spirit. So that's why we have a few things around us. So that's, uh, yeah, that actually describes the background of the screen today. So, yeah, so for me, it's my second second Zoom event. <laughs> so for me, it's also a little bit getting used to this way of communication. So yeah, also for my part, welcome everybody. And um, we're going to talk about a few aspects of the mind. Yeah, we don't have enough time to go very elaborately about what it's all about. Uh, the mind, its conventional aspect and its ultimate aspects. So but before we start uh, following the you know, the advice of the Buddha and following the advice of the lineage masters, it's always important to set a good motivation. Yeah, as the Buddha said always very clearly, whatever we do physically, verbally or mentally depends on intention. Yeah, and so uh, whatever the outcome is of that particular activity also depends on intention. So for that purpose, it's important to generate, generate a good motivation, as we say. So for that purpose, maybe just try to think that we're here together we could only talk about things of the mind. We're going to talk about the potentials of the mind and how to, uh, you know, how to progress in, in, in mind training. So, for that purpose, why are we doing that? In order to eliminate, uh, so they say, the suffering, and uh, by eliminating the suffering, achieving everlasting happiness of nirvana or full enlightenment. Yeah? So, uh, that's those achievements we try to strive for and for that purpose we are here you know that's a kind of a buddhist interpretation those who are not buddhist they can think in a more secular or universal aspect of motivation and think that you're here together in order to learn learn more about the mind and well to eliminate destructive emotions and generate more constructive ones in order to achieve more kind of sustainable forms of happiness for self and others yeah so try to generate either of these motivations for yourself All right, so then I'm going to do something with the screen, meaning that I'm going to look at more people. Yeah, so that I feel more comfortable because I was just looking at myself. <laughs> so now I see not all of you, but uh, at least, you know, a group of people. So that's with Zoom a little bit of kind of a challenge for the speaker or the teacher, so to say. Normally, when you have physical people in the audience, you can relate if people are following or not or People getting bored or falling asleep and you have to crack a joke or tell a story <laughs> so yeah that's uh, always good to see a few people so it's a bit of a challenge for me still walking with zoom so uh, yeah so the buddhist today we're going to talk about the mind and its ultimate nature yeah, that's the title of the talk so it's twofold right mind and its ultimate nature so our mind also has two aspects you know we have a conventional aspect and an ultimate aspect so to say so the conventional aspect also has different levels, right? Uh, we have different states of mind. We have positive states of mind, negative states of mind, more coarser states of mind, more subtler states of mind. Yeah? So that all is being categorized, so to say, as the conventional aspects of the mind. Then also we're going to talk about the ultimate nature. So the ultimate nature of the mind means that the mind basically doesn't exist from its own side. It's is free or empty of a self, yeah? selflessness or without a self that exists or that looks to exist uh, from its own side without independence. So that ultimate aspect, uh, basically, uh, you know, can, you can touch certain aspects in what we find in quantum mechanics, that everything is in the nature of interdependence, nothing exists all by itself. And that's also true for our body and that's also true for our mind. Yeah? Our mind as you know, as we're now talking, you're thinking about different things we talk about. So there's a process, right? It's not that the mind by itself is static or is kind of permanent kind of phenomena, right? Existing all by itself without dependence. So there's one aspect of a conventional uh, aspect of the mind, right? 
uh, proving that the mind doesn't exist from its own side with this ultimate aspect of the mind. So, um, to go back to the conventional aspect of the mind, we also have different potentials within our development. We all know there's a possibility of change. Yeah, even in the, in, in the field of, of neuroscience, yeah, the last decade or two decades basically, then people came to know that there is something what is called neuroplasticity. It is possible to change, right? Even if you a little bit more aged. You know? In the early days, they didn't believe that. They thought after mid-20s, uh, your brain is fixed. But now, after, for the last 20 years, they came to the conclusion that there's a possibility to change. So how is that possible? Uh, is by mental training. Right? So uh, how do we know we can change or we can develop a particular potential? Because the different states of mind, so to say, are the more coarser forms of mind or more subtler forms of mind, they in the moment or conventional nature of momentary changing, right? Yeah, so uh, our mind fluctuates. Different thoughts come up, you know, and different thoughts go. Different kind of emotions come up. Different emotions go. Yeah, so that is a kind of fluctuation of different kind of patterns. Yeah, so that proves that the mind is in this nature of interdependence, right? When we look at the news or read the news, it has an effect on our mind. You know? And also the world we see around us, you know, how that world functions also depends on the mind. Yeah? So we say in Buddhism, nirvana depends on the mind. Samsara depends on the mind. Or ultimate happiness depends on the mind. Yeah? Suffering depends also on the mind. So uh, we can prove that as we just talked about in the beginning, it's essential to have a good motivation. All right. So everything we do, even within daily life, you know, uh, for the time being, our spiritual progress, put it a little bit aside, we will touch that later on, but even on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we can see how mental states influences uh, different aspects of our behavior. You know? So that's why the Buddha uh, put so much emphasis on, on mental training, right? and this kind of psychology of the mind. So when we read the news, we can see that, you know, like you read the news that a person in his apartment, some people were talking outside too loudly, so he asked, it was maybe late at night, he asked the persons to please go somewhere else to talk, they didn't listen, and he gets so uptight and angry and he shot them, you know, this one was in the news recently. So then we can see, you know, based on this irritation, this person, what is called this kind of, has this emotional hijack, there's no possibility to subdue the mind at that particular time, and he commits an act of murder, right? So that's one aspect of destructive nature of afflictions or destructive emotions. But we also have a lot of positive states of mind, as you know, right? So when reading the news, because, you know, I spent half of my lifetime in India, <laughs> so Desmond just introduced that uh, I was, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> so sorry for that. Yeah, sorry for that. So you have to do with this white kind of thread hanging from my ear. It's, yeah. the computer closer it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we talked about even Zoom is in the nature of interdependence, as you can see, right? So <laughs> when there's not, uh, we have 98 people, so if it's not, if it's just a few people like this afternoon, then everything works perfectly, and then more people join in, and then Zoom, of course, is uh, not perfect, you know, because it's still within the contaminated world of samsara, so it didn't really work uh, properly. Yeah, that happens sometimes. So, where do we leave? Yeah, so uh, intention, as we just said, uh, can influence our behavior, as we just saw, right? And there's also true verbal behavior. Yeah? You can express things to people uh, out of aversion or anger. Yeah? So also with positive states of mind, same thing. You know, I just was touching, going in that direction of India that I spent half my lifetime in this incredible inspiring country from the point of view of spirituality. Yeah, it's not only Buddhism that is extremely um, has its origin basically in this country and also other forms of faith or religion uh, yeah, is, was in the early days extremely rich. Yeah, so I spent two decades, more than two decades in India and just recently in the news there was this policeman who was so tired at the end of the day looking after uh, you know, a particular city in Maharashtra and it was 10 o'clock in the evening and one old lady asked this policeman, sorry, all the shops are closed, 
you know, we have a birthday of a little uh, boy tomorrow, so please can you get me a birthday cake? So <laughs> this policeman had, you know, a certain form of compassion for his family, right? So though being extremely tired, he called one of his friends, who was a baker, and he organized a birthday cake. And then when you read the news like that, it's kind of, oh, nice. Or, you know, the BBC reporter who gave his own shoes to a person who was walking home for 200 kilometers without footwear. So this reporter saw that and gave his own shoes, right? So that comes from a positive state of mind, but it has such an impact, not only on the individual, but whoever sees that act. You know, when we see an act of murder, it's like, you know, we automatically react. When we see an act of goodness, it's all automatically like, oh, nice, that's really inspiring, right? So then, so whatever happens around us in the world, basically, is originated in the mind, in these kind of intentions, right? In these attitudes. So, and the Buddha also taught, it's possible to change and to enhance those kind of positive states of mind and to reduce negative states of mind that we call destructive emotions. Yeah? So in that way, uh, it's a kind of mental training that we're going to talk about. Yeah? So on a conventional level, we can train in order to understand these negative states of mind and how to get rid of them, so to say. Right? So the complete absence of, of negative states of mind, uh, destructive emotions, together with the seeds, right? together with the potentials, because they're not always manifest, as you know. We're not always angry, or we don't have always attachment, or we don't have always kind of compassion. Right? So the mind fluctuates. Certain states are more dormant at certain times, other states are more manifest. So that means that the possibility of change is there. Right? So it's just a matter of using the right kind of techniques to bring the mind in a particular direction. Yeah? So that's, and that has an effect, as we saw in physical and verbal behaviors. You know? So it is true with crime, that is true with good deeds in society, as we just saw. It depends on this kind of mental attitudes. Yeah? So that's why the Buddha spent a lot of time uh, talking about you know, these aspects of psychology or mind science. Yeah? The Buddha uh, basically is kind of a scientist, a scientist of the mind. You know, when I, uh, as Desmond also said, I was into hydrology, and in the Netherlands is very, uh, you get a very good job if you're good, uh, <laughs> good in hydrology because there's a lot of you know, a need uh, for people with knowledge of hydrology because half of the country is below sea level, so <laughs> we have to do a lot with the water. You know? So anyway, um, as a sign, you know, background in science, when I went to my first teachings in Buddhism, then what mostly attracted me is this kind of scientific approach, you know, that the Buddha said, don't accept, you know, what I say out of respect or reverence or faith for me. You should analyze, analyze what I say, if it's true or not, you know. So that's a very incredible form of advice, and that also proves that we are open for questions, right? So um, that's why this openness for questions. If you know a little bit about the tradition we come from, in, though in the Tibetan tradition, but it's basically based on what I just said, on the Nalanda tradition of India, that the same tradition as existed in Nalanda, uh, Vikramashila, Takshila, yeah, the great monastic universities in old India, that same tradition is kept alive in, in India in, by Tibetans who fled from Occupy Tibet. It's a very incredible system of thousands of monks, you know, analyzing these teachings exactly according to this advice. You shouldn't accept, you should analyze. So we spend, on an average day, we spend about two or two, three hours analyzing these teachings in a very profound, systematic way of, 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 of reasoning or epistemology, using a kind of physical debate. Uh, it's a very incredible system that analyzes these teachings. In a, in a very profound way. So also that openness, we don't accept whatever is being written, we don't accept whatever other person says, but we examine and using the different logics of epistemology. So our mind basically needs the same aspects of mental training. We need reasoning to analyze and to counteract the different kind of destructive emotions. Because our mind functions in a similar way. When we get angry or when aversion arises, you know, uh, it's also our mind within a few split seconds is capable of reasoning huh, I don't like this because of 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 this within a few split seconds the mind comes to a conclusion 
though the reasonings are not all valid right, in this context. But the mind uses this kind of analytical approach to come to the final conclusion and believe that conclusion to be true. Right? So the same we should apply in applying the antidotes. Yeah? Applying the antidotes meaning uh, contemplate the faults of an affliction or destructive emotion and contemplate the benefits of the constructive emotion. Yeah? It's kind of, if you believe in a particular direction to be the right one, you are automatically move in that direction, right? If you want to study to become a doctor, yeah, the more you understand the benefits of being a doctor, the more you will generate inspiration to go in that direction, right? Yeah, so that means we have to be convinced about certain aspect, and then the mind will change. Yeah, so that's why a possibility in, in mental training works in a similar way. We analyze destructive emotion, right? And then focus upon the faults of destructive emotion, but from a neutral perspective, you know, like a scientist observing a particular kind of uh, phenomena, right? So without IDs, we just examine what is the case. Is this particular state of mind constructive or destructive? Yeah, so we take examples out of daily life and we check it out. Yeah, and then we can come to the conclusion that uh, certain aspects of the mind are being classified as maybe negative, where other aspects of the mind are being classified as positive. So that's why the Buddha said, you know, those that produces happiness, we call uh, virtue. That which produces suffering, we call non-virtue, right? So this, that virtue or good deeds produces happiness, and non-virtue or negative deeds produces suffering. It's not that the Buddha invented that. That's the nature of reality. And which reality? The reality of interdependence. The reality of interdependence of our mind, right? So uh, fire is hot and burning, Right? You know? So fire being hot and burning, we cannot change. Right? But we can prevent our hand from going into the fire. Right? So with the mind is the same thing. You know, that anger causes disturbance of the mind and can motivate negative verbal and physical behaviors. That nature actually we cannot really change. But we can subdue the mind to prevent that from happening. Right? So that's why the Buddha has been called actually a scientist. You know? In Tibetan, there is a saying, tendel dik. Tendel means dependent, origination, right? And dik means to organize. So that doesn't mean that we in control over the law of reality, right? That the seed produces a sprout when the right conditions are met, like soil, fertilization, heat and moisture, right? That reality we cannot change. But we can play with the condition to let it grow quicker, Right? That we can play with. So, in a similar way, the mind we can use in a way to enhance this kind of positive state of mind. Right? To, to enhance kind of constructive forms of mind and to prevent negative states of mind from coming into being. So, how do we do that? By using this kind of analytical uh, way of thinking. Of course, there's also other techniques, right? Uh, initially, we have to have kind of calmness of the mind. Yeah? So, that has to do with the nature of the mind as well. So the real happiness, so to say, doesn't come from outside. So most of you know that already, I don't have to say that, that our sensory perceptions never really give ultimate satisfaction, right? So whatever we do with our senses, the more you engage into particular aspects of the senses, you don't become happier and happier and happier, right? Watching a movie or watching you on Zoom, you know, if I really like that, do that again and again and again. It's not that my mind becomes happier and happier, right? So that means that whatever we look externally, you know, as a cause for happiness, the more you engage it in it, it's not really proving to, to establish a kind of happiness that stays with us. You know? Well, mental training can go much further, right? So even just getting quietness of mind, you know, with concentration or some other, you know, Generating samadhi in this way already gives so much more peace of mind and satisfaction. Because if you, for example, seen as an example, you know, you now in the lockdown, you know, we all back home. I can see everybody in the living rooms. <laughs> it's quite personal sometimes. You can see exactly where people are living. You know, but uh, so if you use the time we have in lockdown 
in a particular way to contemplate things is a very fortunate situation to a certain extent, of course. There's a lot of suffering happening, right? But we cannot change the situation we are in right now. So whatever state of mind we have towards the situation, that we can change. Yeah, we cannot change the coronavirus to be stopped within a second or from tomorrow onwards, right? So that's why we have this lockdown, right? But we can change our mental behavior to our experience being within this lockdown. So if you back home and you, you know, you read something, you, maybe some of you probably have that experience that the mind settles a little bit. You know, if you don't uh, watch too many things on social media, for example, or you come up, wake up in the morning and, you know, you do your prayers or, you know, you contemplate things of life, the mind is a little bit of peace, right? But as soon as you look at the news and then, oh, I have to read this as well, because, you know, I saw the same thing when I was in the monastery for uh, yeah 20 something years i only watched the news maybe once every month or every two months and then watched the news and thought oh it's pretty much the same as last month <laughs> so but now uh, being this kind of you know uh, situation then of course you want to know more right so even now i did a two-month retreat here in jamia and uh, because my mother is in lockdown on the other on the other side of the can yeah outside of the north sea and uh, yeah i have some other People did to me, so I thought, okay, I have to follow the news a bit and be in contact with them. So then I saw myself, if you read the news, then oh, I have to know this also, I have to know this also. And before you know it, you spend a lot of time reading all these things, right? And of course, we need to have the information, but there's a limit, right? So the more you get into, especially in the social media, there's a lot of things posted, then the mind gets out of this piece, right? So the mind gets a little bit kind of disturbed, so to say, and we lose that peace of mind. Yeah? So that means that the things of the sensory perception actually takes the mind outward, right? So then we go back inwards if you, or if you follow a discipline, you know, reading things or doing things online and then every now and then you take a rest and then just breathe in, breathe out, take a rest, then you keep the, the, the peace of the mind, right? So that's another important aspect of mental training, right? To have a calm mind because if the mind is too excited or too dull, yeah, there's two extremes, then we cannot meditate, we cannot analyze. Yeah? So meditation doesn't mean to go in a cave somewhere up in the mountains. Yeah? Meditation means a kind of habituation to something positive. Right? So that you can do where you're sitting right now, you know, on the sofa or on the chair or on the ground. As long as you know, the mind is in a position not to be either too much distracted and have too many kind of things that prevent you from clear thinking. You know? So in that way, we can develop the mind using these aspects of mental training by, first of all, calming down the mind by either breathing whatsoever, and then uh, by having calmed down the mind, try to contemplate different aspects of mental training. Because most of these destructive emotions, as we move on to the next level of the mind, is they are not in accordance with reality. Yeah, we have two levels of reality we just talked about, the conventional one and an ultimate one. Yeah, so the destructive emotions, the constructive emotions, yeah, the mind being impermanent, the possibility to change, it's all kind of conventional reality, so to say. Uh, but a mind has also an incredible potential, right? So uh, that has been classified as ultimate aspects of the mind. So, ultimate aspects of the mind, uh, you can also classify in different ways, right? So, the real ultimate aspect of the mind, so to say, is the mind that is empty, as we technically say, empty of inherent existence, or empty of a concrete mind that exists from its own side. Yeah? Using reasoning that uh, our consciousness, so to say, is just a fluctuation of streams of moments and thoughts. And mental factors play a role, they come up. They abide, disintegrate, right? So within that whole flux of processes of thinking or emotions that come and go, there's no really con concrete uh, consciousness to be found that exists all by itself, right? So that means that the mind is also in this nature of interdependence. That's one aspect. And this interdependence also has different levels, yeah. more coarser forms of mind and more subtler ones. So like a mind's in anger or mind, you know, being uptight, you know, is, is a very coarse state of, of consciousness. 
Well, a mind being a little bit more subtle in the sense of cutting down these destructive emotions when you contemplate things or when people practice uh, samatha meditation, for example. Right? So at that time, the mind settles in and there's a kind of quietness of the mind. Right? So being this quietness of the mind also has different aspects. Yeah? We talk about sometimes the clarity of the mind or the mind of clear light or the mind of being clear and knowing. Yeah, so also the mind, this aspect of the most subtle aspect of the conventional state of the nature of the mind, right? this conventional nature of the mind is free of all states, like the blue sky being free of the clouds. You know? All these kind of negative thoughts, these destructive emotions, they like the clouds. Right? They're not an innate part of the, of, the, of the blue sky. So the mind, its nature by itself, has this clarity. Right? So this clarity it proves, that also proves that we can change the mind. We just saw we can change the mind because of these destructive emotions being not always present, they're in the nature of change, right? and they're not in constant reality. Yeah? So uh, another aspect of this person who shot, these people who were talking too loudly outside his apartment, so you can imagine he goes outside, he asks the persons to be quiet, they don't listen, he goes back to his room. What happens? <clears throat> he starts thinking about how these people behave, right? And then he just builds up this image of these persons outside mentally. These persons are not nice because of this. They disturb my peace, my, my, my quietness. You know? How dare they to do that? And it builds up, builds up, builds up, and they generate a kind of conceptual consciousness which generates a kind of what the technique called meaning generality is a kind of mental image so to say, of the people outside. So this mental image of the people outside are not the people outside, right? So this person gets angry because apprehending or, you know, this mental image appears to him, right? So that means that this mental image is not reality. It's mentally fabricated, you know? So uh, Aaron Beck, one of the professors in the US, uh, who actually came to a very similar conclusion, he said, most 90% of what people perceive in a rage of anger is mentally fabricated and is not in concert reality. One conclusion he draw. Another conclusion he said is the, where people actually angry get at, at, at is actually at this mental image, not at the actual person. Very interesting conclusion. So that means that we fabricate a kind of reality within our mind and then think that's true, right? So that's why whatever appears to the mind is not always reality. So, based on those aspects of these destructive emotions, that they not in a part of this clarity of the mind, one aspect, these destructive emotions are in the moment of change, right? It proves with the neuroplasticity that we can change, right? And then this purity of the mind is not stained by these kind of temporarily afflictions or temporarily destructive emotions. So, those different threefold reasons we just talked about, actually proves the possibility of change and proves the possibility of achieving happiness okay, by eliminating these destructive emotions. And going back to this nature of the mind, or this clarity of the mind, yeah, that proves that as long as we stay in that, that period, there's no kind of uh, disturbance. When we come out of that period, then we have to use mental training. Right? So whenever we meet an object, yeah, so our consciousness is there. Yeah. There's a kind of physical aspect of our body, like the eyeball, and the optic nerve, for example. And there's an object. Right? There's a threefold thing of object, consciousness, and, and, and a physical, or a technical physical sense power. Yeah. So by the combination of those three, when it comes into contact, there's a feeling. Right? Yeah. So there's a feeling, either pleasure or unpleasant, or neutral feeling. Based on either of those feelings, we generate a kind of uh, response, right? We either like it or dislike it. And human beings are in the nature of wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. So that proves that the things we like, we like to engage in. The things we dislike, we like to be separated from. Yeah? So that, that proves that, you know, the food we like, we order these days, people do a lot of ordering online. Also here I noticed in the 
in the area that's a kind of uh, scooter or bicycle yeah motorbike who actually delivers in this area we never heard before but the last few weeks is more evident in this area so people order look online beautiful images of whatever they order with italian or indian food whatsoever yeah so then they generate this image out of attachment and then it's delivered and then at the delivery it's not the same as on the screen right so the attachment we generated towards the screen is not actually the object you see so with attachments is a similar thing you know we we fabricate a mental image of our attachments we fabricate a mental image of the things we dislike yeah and then there's a feeling with it oh, i like this so we order so that's why the Commercial industry is so clever to make the pictures as nice as possible, because then we like. Now also, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm quite new to social media as well, because in the monastery I was living very low key. <laughs> so uh, in the social media also you have like dislike, you know. So yeah, that's that's all has to do with, you know, how we perceive things and how we react. You know, there's an object, there's contact with our consciousness, and then this feeling either pleasure or displeasure then we like or dislike, you see? So this person in this apartment, he didn't like the people being so noisy outside, and that enhances this kind of aversion and anger and into the act of killing, right? So then this policeman in Maharashtra, in, in India, had a completely different approach. He was tired, you know? You could all say, oh, mother, please, why don't you ask me? I'm tired, I want to go home. You know? But then he ordered his birthday cake, you know? So that means that these positive states of mind has a is motivated by a kind of mental attitude and then produces something positive, right? And these negative states of mind, uh, they, they can be taken away. That's what we're talking about. Because they're not in constant reality. Yeah? Because of these mental images, that is not in constant reality, right? And because it's not in a part of, this of the mind. Yeah? Because the most subtle state of mind is this kind of clarity of the mind. Yeah? So that's a very um, subject basically studied very late in the studies. Yeah? So the clarity of the mind is a lot of interests. Uh, most of you probably have similar interests in Dzogchen, Mahamudra, Klilat mind. Yeah? It's very inspiring teachings, right? How actually the clarity of the mind, so to say, as long as you abide in the clarity of the mind, there's no possibility for these destructive emotions to take over. Right? So that means that these destructive emotions, in a similar way, if you meet an object, there's a contact. And there's a feeling, right? So the contact and the feeling, we cannot really prevent from happening. Unless you put yourself in a room in complete darkness, you know, but uh, it's very difficult, right? So, uh, and then still, yeah. So if we meet an object, so there's contact, but with the feeling that arises, how we react, that we can, that's in our hands, you know? So for that purpose, we can do a lot, you know, either don't believe a particular reality, you know, how a particular thing appears to our mind, is maybe not really out there like that. You know? Or, so we don't try to go to extremes of like or dislike, and then generate kind of strong emotions of attachment, or, or jealousy, or pride, or aversion, or anger. You know? So that contact and feeling we cannot really prevent, but how we react we can, we can prevent. So the more you habituate your mind to a kind of this quietness of the mind, you have much more control. The mind becomes like a mirror. Yeah, if you don't have real awareness, it's very difficult to train the mind. And that's why they say these kind of people who commit crimes, they just in this emotional hijack. Right? If you don't know your own feelings, how do you know the feelings of others? You know? So that's the first step in, in in, you know, in the movement of emotional intelligence, for example, the first step is kind of self-awareness, to know what's going on inside our mind, right? So we have to have the knowledge of, of you know, of the, of, the, of the teachings or how people describe destructive emotions, right? And then we have to contemplate, is it true or not? And analyze and make it a part of us. Yeah? So just academic knowledge is not enough. We need information, but then we have to contemplate if it's true or not, yeah? And how does it apply in our daily life? So, if you generate this kind of self-awareness, so to say, yeah, then the next step is self-discipline. If you have this kind of awareness what's going on, that's the first step. You know? Then you know actually what development is needed and how to do it. You know? So then you see that these destructive emotions, 
are basically disturbing, not in accordance with reality. They can be taken away, right? So based on these kind of reasons, you generate an interest of development, right? So uh, those aspects we have to see if it's true or not. To analyze, as the Buddha said, you know, don't believe what I say. You examine, like you examine gold, for example. In the early days in India, to buy one of the most precious things in life was gold, right? So in order to make sure it's the right, now also the, <laughs> these days gold seems to be quite popular in the, in the you know, in the, in the different countries because of the difficulty on an economic level in the different countries. Yeah, so gold is... But anyway, at the time of the Buddha, the Buddha said, examine, you know, like rubbing it or breaking it down or melting it. So in a similar way, we should analyze you know, what is being talked about and how does that apply to me and how can I learn from that and if it's true or not. You know? So the Buddha said, you know, virtue produces happiness, right? Non-virtue produces suffering. That's a law of reality that we cannot change, but we can play with these conditions to prevent, you know, uh, negative deeds or non-virtue being created and to act in a way that's virtuous. Right? So then the Buddha said uh, in one of the verses from the sutras, as we uh, have the verses from the sutra from the Sanskrit tradition, there the Buddha said, you know, uh, abandon non-virtue, you know, engage in virtue, subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. It's a very sophisticated verse that actually proves, okay, we all want happiness and don't want suffering, right? So what are the causes for happiness and what are the causes for suffering? So that, in that way, the Buddha was very skillful in letting us do self-research. Yeah, so we check what states of mind are disturbing, what states of mind are constructive. Yeah, so those constructive states of mind, they produce happiness, right? Those destructive states of mind produce suffering. So, knowing that aspect and generating kind of self-awareness, then the next step of self-discipline can come around the corner. You know, that you know how to subdue the mind. You know? So, in the whole movement of emotional intelligence in, in, in Western psychology, uh, we can see that this kind of development of mind seems to work. You know, there's a lot of uh, one of you know is. My famous uh, writers in that regard, Daniel Coleman, who did a lot of kind of very, you know, scientific related kind of evidence proving these aspects of, of emotional intelligence that we can change and how we can change. Yeah? So that's being researched in, in colleges, in, in, you know, even part of the New York police force trained on these kind of uh, projects. It's very interesting. It's interesting to see that we need, especially as a Westerner, to see the scientific evidence also to prove that it's uh, functioning. The same is true for our nature of the mind, right? So there's a lot of research being done uh, in, this in the field of neuroscience and in particular in the field of neurophenomenology, right? So they came to this term neurophenomenology because there's a correlation between brain activity and that what we classify as consciousness. So consciousness is not a physical brain. Yeah, according to uh, the Buddha, and according to certain neuroscientists, they open to this aspect of, uh, of consciousness. Right. So, what is the correlation then between consciousness and brain activity? So that's been quite well examined to a certain extent. That with meditators uh, from different traditions, right, they can produce gamma waves, which is beyond the chart of an ordinary being, so to say. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of some uncommon things to be seen that high level of gamma waves actually proves to certain interpretations that you don't grasp at things that much. There's a kind of fluctuation, right? Like a river where you draw, make a drawing in the river, it goes. You know, there's no grasping. Well, most of us in ordinary life, you know, we watch the news and then our mind is completely, even if it's just like a few minutes, it's completely taken over. Right? We hold on to these kind of emotions. Right? So, uh, in this research with these meditators, uh, it's very interesting to see they produce this high scale of gamma waves which is actually beyond the chart, which has never been measured before. So that proves that by the power of meditation, the human brain, or together with consciousness, can produce states of development that is very interesting to see we haven't seen in other forms of, of, of brain activity. 
And also, a friend of mine in the University of Pisa did also a lot of research between uh, mental impairments in, 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 in humans as well as the fluctuation of, of different patterns in brain activity. And he also came to a conclusion that there's a pattern of non-thought or clarity of the mind, or in this case brain activity, that is completely disturbed by people who have issues. Right? And uh, with meditators, it seems to be a very kind of structured pattern. It's very interesting research because also within uh, Buddhist psychology, it talks about these moments of clarity of the mind in between thoughts. Very interesting. You know? So uh, these clarities, if the mind, just from an experiential point of view, you can feel, right? If you in your room in the lockdown, you relax for some time, the mind settles. Right? This kind of peace. Then you see or read the news, then the mind gets disturbed. You see? So then this peace is still there underneath the surface. Right? It's like a big lake or, or an ocean. Deep down is stillness, right? On the surface, there's the movement. Yeah? So that proves that this kind of clarity of the mind is always present, though most of the time you're not aware of it. Right? So there are techniques to be more aware of that clarity. And if you're more aware of that clarity, then these waves actually don't disturb anymore. Yeah, that's one aspect. So that's all still conventional aspects of the mind. So the title was Mind and its Ultimate Reality, right? So the ultimate aspect <laughs> I didn't touch yet, yeah, because it's a little bit more complicated, uh, because the ultimate aspect of the mind is a kind of aspect of the mind that actually proves that it doesn't exist from its own side. Yeah? So we, in Buddhism, we talk about self and selflessness, right? or without a self. Yeah? We talk, in, in, in Sanskrit, we have Atma and Atma. Right? So first of all, we have to know what is the self. You know? And then we know what is it empty of. So we talk about selflessness, we talk about emptiness. Right? So we have to know what is emptiness and what is selflessness. What is empty of what? What is you know, an absence of which self. So that's very important to know. Right? So from the point of view of the mind, you know, it looks like it appears very concrete, you know, like, uh, you know, everything, like the people we dislike, that mental image looks to exist from its own side without any dependence. Though it's just created by thoughts. But it looks like very concrete. I don't like this person. I don't like that person. And that, that image is so solid that we believe it exists without dependence, you see? And that's also true for all our problems in life, they become like a rock without possibility to change, you know? So that you can break down by understanding this ultimate reality of the mind. Because all this kind of, from its own side existing, my feeling, my this, my that, basically if you examine, you cannot find a concrete from its own side existing consciousness within that continuity of thoughts. You know? We start at like uh, 6.30, right? So now uh, 50 minutes are gone. So within those 50 minutes, you know, every minute there's a different thought. And within every minute, every split second, there's mental activity. In that flux of mental activity and thoughts, there's nothing concrete to be found. Oh, this is consciousness. It's not that it appears sometime in that way, right? But it's not to be found. So that means that the mind is empty or lacking this concrete aspect of consciousness. So the same is true in quantum mechanics. You know, the table in front of us or the screen, you know, the computer, it looks all so concrete, existing from its own side, you know, out there. But if you look on the quantum level, then it's not that solid anymore. You know, the correlations between the subatomic particles are more important than the collection of the concrete kind of solid thing we have in front of us. You know? So that also proves the interdependence of the things around us, that nothing exists the way it appears. Right? That's true in quantum mechanics, same thing. You know? How things is being observed depends on the observer. Right? So that interdependence of our mind and what is being perceived is is very valid, you know, not only from a Buddhist perspective, but even from the from scientific findings. So that means that with those things going together, we can see that 
these kind of aspects of reality that nothing exists from its own side, but just in the nature of interdependence, right? And that's also true for our mind, that's also true for our body, same thing. It appears very, if we look at all your images, it looks like very concrete persons there, in very concrete rooms, you know, looking at the screen, very concrete screen probably, you know. So that means how things appear to us and how actually reality is are two different things, you see? So you're looking at me, I look at you, you look at the computer, it all looks very solid, right? But before you know it, Zoom can just, like last Sunday, you had kind of, uh, last Sunday, Sunday before, yeah, you were in the middle of a retreat, and Zoom d decided not to work that day, in the whole UK, and part of the US. So, so that means also Zoom is not that concrete out there, okay, I set up this meeting, people have the link, everything perfect, it's not like that, you see? So uh, many occasions in day-to-day in, in -day life, we can actually see how we grasp at things, to be very solid, existing from its own side, right? And that also causes a problem. Because then it's, oh, Zoom again, you know, just in the middle of the meeting, just in the middle of this, you know? Because we don't realize that it's all in nature in, 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 of interdependence. So it can happen, stop any, any time. Same with the whole aspect of um, uh, the coronavirus, you know? I was in Nepal, I was in retreat in eastern uh, Nepal, in quite a remote area with no internet access. So for two, uh, more than two, three weeks, I didn't look at the news or uh, didn't know, really know what's going on. Then I came out of the retreat and the whole world was completely changed. Completely changed. So then going back to Kathmandu, talking to my friends, watching the news, I just couldn't believe it. Because we grasped so much to this concrete, concrete world we know before, you know. So then you can straight away see, oh, and looked at myself and numb numb. You're studying Buddhism for more than two decades, and now you act like this. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, because it gave me incredible teaching that we grasp so much to an aspect that appears to us, but it's not reality. You know? So then, because of interdependence, things change. If you understand this reality of interdependence, it gives so much more peace, because you understand the Zoom will break down one day, or the computer will break down, or these things like, you know, the virus arises, right? So, these aspects, you can see how we perceive things, and how things actually exist, are completely different. So then, from the ultimate nature of the mind, we learn these aspects, and also we understand that the mind's consciousness, right, is not that concrete from its own side. What appears to the mind is not that concrete, it exists from its own side. So in that way, it helps a lot. In, in contemplation. So, is Honus Dai Lama very interesting? Uh, when he gave uh, one teaching once, he, he said, if you think about this kind of interdependence we're just talking about, right, that nothing exists from its own side, and try to see that things lacking this concrete aspect, then if you do that a few times a day, like 16 or whatever time a day you do it on a regular basis, his Holiness says, it looks like afflictions don't arise. Very interesting. Very interesting. Because all these destructive emotions we just talked about, right? Anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, then modern kind of things in society like, you know, you know kind of uh, fear and anxiety, they all build up this kind of concreteness of reality. It doesn't exist. If you understand interdependence and reflect on a daily basis, together what we just talked about, go back to this clarity of the mind, if you have two, two aspects, right, the, the, the quietness of the mind, generating more awareness, what's going on, how do I react, you know, that aspect that we just talked about, because if the mind is uh, in a more kind of subdued way of this piece of the mind, then also you have the possibility to see things coming and going in the mind, right? So when the mind meets its object, there's a feeling, you can still act before it's too late, before the mind takes over and Afflictions take over, it's too late. So that means if you have a kind of aspect of this aspect of the mind, of the cl clarity of the mind, yeah, this kind of neutral aspect of the mind, then you know if you go in this direction, it will be kind of destructive because destructive emotions will come up if you react in a particular way, right? So that we have in control. So using kind of self-discipline at that time can help us a lot. That's one aspect, as we just talked about. 
the other aspects for the ultimate point of view of the mind, to see that how things appear, very concrete out there, but we just saw everything is nature of interdependence, also that understanding of reality helps a lot. Because then if there's no concrete objects as they appear, then also our afflictions or destructive emotions will become less because we understand that things do not exist that concrete out there. You know? So then we don't have to do the like or the dislike, we just have a more neutral understanding. Okay, there's positive sides, there's negative sides, right? Kind of down to earth approach of how things appear to the mind and what is reality. So these two aspects of the mind, the conventional aspect of the mind, of this clarity, together with understanding the possibility of change, the nature you know, of, of the destructive emotions, right? and this understanding of the ultimate nature of the mind, that things are not that concrete out there, those two aspects can help a lot in our day-to-day -day life. You know? Then, from a spiritual point of view, if you want to abandon samsara and achieve nirvana, same thing. You, know, you have to understand the destructive emotions, you have to understand the afflictions, you have to apply the antidotes, and you have to get rid of the root cause of these afflictions, right? Those, these destructive emotions, right? They directly cause suffering, as we just saw, right? With the example of murder, for example, right? So the afflictions directly cause suffering, right? But the root cause of the afflictions is this concrete concept of how things appear to us, you know? So that's why His Holiness said that if you see this reality of interdependence, seeing that things lack this concrete reality, this concrete appearance, you know, then automatically those afflictions, they lose their building blocks to grow. You know? So if you have those two aspects of mental training, then there's a possibility of moving further and further. The more you understand selflessness, the more you go on the, the steps of, of, of the spiritual development, all the way up to liberation of the state of an Arat, for example, or all the way up to the state of enlightenment, right? With a particular motivation. For example, if you motivate yourself to be free of suffering together with its causes, right? Yeah, you understand the suffering of samsara. We just talked about a few aspects of it now, but it's a little bit more, you know, uh, complex if you take lifetimes into the picture, etc., etc. So that means if you understand the suffering of samsara, wish to be free of it, together with this understanding of selflessness, you're able to achieve nirvana, right? Then if you motivate yourself uh, with the purpose of wanting to become a Buddha, a full enlightened being, yeah, for the purpose of liberating all sentient beings, for that purpose I have to achieve this state, then we have a kind of what we call bodhicitta, or body means enlightenment, right? Chit means mind, chitta means mind. So the mind of enlightenment, meaning a wish for others to be free of suffering, and for that purpose I like to become Buddha. So that wish, together with this understanding of this ultimate nature of reality, right, that nothing exists out there from its own side, everything lacks these concrete aspects, then you can move up this you know, spiritual path all the way up to enlightenment. Yeah? So through these aspects of the nature of the mind, conventional aspects, as we just discussed, and the ultimate aspects, you can, on a secular level, we don't have to call it Buddhism, because the nature of the mind is the same if you're Buddhist or not a Buddhist, right? So that means that it can be applied by all human beings, right? You don't have to be a Buddhist for this purpose, right? So that's a kind of secular aspect. And then the Buddhist approach is kind of using these kind of things we talked about with a particular motivation to move in a particular spiritual path to uh, liberation and enlightenment. Yeah, yeah, I've been given 50 minutes or... Uh, after Desmond's in the introduction, yeah, it's about 50-something, yeah. So that's mainly, of course, it's a very short period to talk about the nature of the mind or the ultimate nature of the mind, uh, you know, you can go for hours or you can have a whole course, so it's a very brief introduction, so to say. Yeah. So for me, it's very difficult if people are following or not, or do we have to go in more depth or, or not in Zoom, I still have to get used to this aspect, so... Sorry if it was too simple, and sorry if it was too complicated. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we have some time for questions and answers. Yeah, questions, answers? Hmm? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm unmuted now. Thank yeah. you so much for a lovely talk. Thank you. It was very clear. There's a number of questions here. Yeah. Um, and the first one is human nature seems to be so rigid and we don't seem to be able to learn lessons. And furthermore, the lessons we do learn, we don't seem to be able to pass them from one generation to the next. Yeah. And Geshe, you've trained for so many years, but is there a simple practice for just an ordinary layperson to use who's very busy and, and working all the time? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just the first part of the question, you know, is kind of, uh, that's a kind of a big picture, right? It's not on a personal level, right? So to change the whole world, it's difficult, right? So, but we can start on an individual level, you know? So if everybody starts on an individual level, that's also not that easy to accomplish. But at least there's, there's, it's better to start on an individual level than not starting at all, right? <laughs> so from that purpose, from that point of view, and there's a lot of movements, you know, not only within Buddhism, but in other forms of, of what we call social and emotional learning, right? So a lot of projects uh, been going on uh, of the secular aspects of these kind of mind trainings. Right? So, um, yeah, so on the individual level, what we just talked about, you know, try to become a good human being and show a good example. You know, that's, that's the main thing to start with. You know? And then, of course, the different organizations, they can have kind of platforms to have kind of secular aspects, yeah? because we don't have to call it Buddhism or Buddhist psychology or whatsoever. We can just call it emotional intelligence or you know, how to help people to achieve more happiness. Right? So uh, there's a lot of movements like that, luckily. Yeah? So, of course, if you see the news, there's a lot of negative things there, but there's also positive things, right? So we saw the reporter giving us our shoes, right? We saw this policeman giving a birthday cake. So those things, you know, we should kind of admire, you know, because we look always at the negative aspects of the news because that's the majority, but there's so many good things happening as well. You know? Then on top of that, kind of have a kind of positive attitude, right? We live in a time what we call, from Buddhist perspective, the time of the five degenerations. Yeah, so that means, uh, as we just saw with this example coming out of the retreat and the whole world has changed, right? that is not in all our control. So we cannot, on the individual level we're talking, right? we cannot change. Same with env environmental problems. On the individual level we cannot change it. But we can help organizations to make platforms and to change society by changing the mind. That's a possibility, right? That's one thing. Another aspect is our mental attitude towards issues, right? So if you're facing this lockdown, some people I spoke to, you know, they actually quite okay with the lockdown. Some people find it very difficult. So that means we have a situation we cannot change, but we can be in control of our mental attitude. How do we react to this situation, right? So in that way, it's been proven many levels that you can deal with situations mentally in a way that you prevent a lot of suffering from coming. For example, in, in Occupy Tibet, you know, in, 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 in the prisons where many monks and nuns and, or lay people were being tortured, especially in the beginning uh, after the invasion in, in uh, 1959, right? So some of the people in prison, Tibetans, they've been tortured for a decade, some for two decades. Physically, you know, they broke it. Mentally, they're strong, extremely strong. So one uh, person from a medical school of Harvard did research and came to the conclusion that the majority of the people who come out of these very difficult, intense forms of life, it's a little bit more intense than we sitting in a lockdown in a comfortable room, right? So being tortured, etc., almost dying, no food, you know? not for one day, for decades. A majority of the people who come out of these kind of situations, they prove, they prove, it's been proven that most of them, they don't have this post-traumatic stress disorder. Very interesting. So that means, when His Holiness was asked the question, why? How is that possible? Then His Holiness said, uh, it's mental training. If you know how to deal with a problem, right, then mentally there's less suffering. For example, if you have a problem and you can solve it, like we just talked about, start to make platforms, you know, start to help society to think in a different way, you know, so that's possible, right? But we cannot change the world, that's not possible. So understanding when something, when you can solve the problem, then solve it and don't worry. 
right? If you have a problem where you cannot solve it, because it's beyond your capacity, then why worry? You know? <laughs> so that prevents a lot of suffering. So that's a very interesting quote from Shantideva, one of the uh, great masters of Nalanda, who said that, you know, if you have a problem, you can solve it, solve it. If you have a problem you cannot solve it, why worry? Because you cannot solve it, you have to deal with it. You know, so that's a kind of how our mental attitude can change a lot. Yeah. Is that okay or not? Hmm. Yes, and um, is there a simple, is there really a simple practice for, for an ordinary yeah. lay person to do? Just a simple practice. There's many simple practices, for example, uh, you know, just, just matter of fact of breathing exercise or counting the breath, right? So there's concentration meditations where you just count every in-breath as one, out-breath as two, in-breath as three, and you count from one to ten and start over-counting, right? So that generates, if you focus your mind on that pattern, right, you count, so your object of concentration is the counting, right? So that means that every other thought that comes to mind, you try to prevent from taking over. So you learn your mind to be in control. You learn only to focus on one object at one particular time, generating concentration. Right? So the more you develop this aspect of a very simple aspect of just the counting of the breath, you try to have a little bit of effort as soon as we think about the past or the future, we don't follow that thought. Go back to the counting of the breath, right? Because most of the time when we try to meditate, we're either thinking about the past or the future. We're never in the present, you know? So <laughs> we have to try to let our mind focus on one object at a time. It is, in this case, the counting of the breath. And then prevent those two extremes, you know? Of either the mind gets too distracted, you know? Thinking about past and future. Or the mind gets kind of dullness, you know? No clarity. So we try to have this middle way, you know, and try to generate concentration. That by itself will bring much more self-awareness, as we just talked about. Yeah? So with the self-awareness, you were capable of being in more control of the mind. Yeah? So in, in psychology, for example, they come to similar conclusions. You know, they have this kind of inverted U shape, right? In the top of the U, inverted U, is kind of highest productivity in the office, right? One extreme is depression or no interest, right? Where we can classify as dullness, just daydreaming. The other extreme is stress or excitement, being distracted all the time. So when the mind is either distracted too much or the mind is, that shows no interest, there's no improvement, there's no productivity, as they say. Yeah? So that's kind of, in, in you know, managers in the office, they came to that conclusion. But when the mind is in the middle, you know, with focus, concentration, then there's much more things that can be done from a worldly perspective. From the perspective of training the mind, it works very similar. You know, you prevent your mind from either getting into daydreaming, you know, or getting completely distracted. So you learn to concentrate on one object at one particular time with counting the breath. You know, so by doing that, you generate this kind of self-awareness. The more you generate self-awareness, you be much more aware of an object. Consciousness meets an object. Feeling, what kind of feeling? How, does I, how do I react? Right? So that's the first step of training the mind. Yeah? So then already, if you have this simple meditation technique, it helps you to be in much more control. Being in much more control, actually it brings much more peace of mind. Yeah? Because you don't let your mind be overpowered by the stream of negative thoughts or these destructive emotions. Is it simple enough or not? Yes, that sounds like a very simple question of doing it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pandit Nehru, when one of the great, uh, yeah, also from government from India, when he met with His Holiness Dalai Lama after His Holiness fled from Tibet, he said to His Holiness, Buddhism, you know, uh, is, is very difficult to put into practice. <laughs> But when you put this into practice, when you put it into practice, it can have great benefits. Yeah. Um, yes, and more, more questions. Um, there's one here. What advice would you give to those keen to develop their practice during this period of lockdown? Yeah. So lockdown basically, you know, is a very good kind of period to reflect things. 
So you can see, you know, people in, in London even, people start reflecting, oh, when we go back, we want to have a greener London. So the people start to use the bike instead of the public transport or the car. So that means if your mind settles down, like a lockdown, same as a lockdown for the mind, when the mind settles down, there's more opportunity to think. Otherwise, we're just always busy. When I just came to, to London after, you know, being for a long time in South India, when you go, you know, in, 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 uh, in peak hour, it's kind of people so concentrated to where they walk and go, and it's so busy. The mind is so kind of full of different thoughts, right? So that means when you're in lockdown, you have the possibility to change, to, to contemplate. What comes up to the mind? Especially what we just talked about, to bring this self-awareness, we need a quiet mind, right? And we need it without distraction. Yeah, we just talked about, we try not to think about the past and the future. You try to be in the present. So if you're in a lockdown, there's more opportunity to do that before the distractions take over from social media, etc., etc. And so a lot of masters, you know, they use this kind of situations. One of my own teachers, who was in occupied Tibet, uh, was hidden in a room in the city of Lhasa for 19 years. So there was a lockdown of 19 years. He never left the room. In those 19 years, he accomplished the realizations of the whole plot. Very interesting. He was in retreat all the whole time. So that means if we have a problem and we cannot solve it with the lockdown, the only thing we can do is work with it with our mind, our mental attitude. So that is in our capacity. That we can, you know, change. So in that, from that point of view, in the lockdown of being isolated, in one way we can use it as, you know, reflecting upon things. If it's really true, what brings happiness? And what brings suffering? What are these aspects of the mind? You know, you can read something, but also look inside. So, from that point of view, there's opportunity. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, um, a comment here, really, but you might have something to say about it. Yeah. It's from Rowan Nadu. Um, in the ultimate reality sense, is it true that mind cannot be before matter? This would be because mind and matter are ultimately independent, so that mind and matter are more designations or labels from the perspective of conventional reality. In other words, mind is not concrete and matter is not concrete. They are interdependent. Thank you, a wonderful talk. So, uh, yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is not a simple answer. Is that okay? <laughs> because uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama also once said when we met His Holiness for a meeting as, uh, with a few Westerners, then His Holiness said, oh, initially the teachings of the Buddha were very simple, but then these Nalanda scholars made it so complicated. You know? But then His Holiness straight away said, but in these degenerated times, we need a lot of logic to counteract these afflictions. Yeah, that's one aspect. But anyway, so uh, one aspect of the question uh, I don't agree with because they not mind and matter are not independent. They depend upon each other. Though both mind and matter are merely imputed by the mind. And being merely imputed by the mind proves they are interdependent. Because they don't exist from their own side, they merely impute it. They merely label it. This is mind, this is matter. For example, our continuity of consciousness, the stream of consciousness, right? from uh, 6.30 until now. That stream of consciousness you call, oh, the stream of consciousness of Namdak, right? So if I look every split second in those, you know, one hour, 50 minutes, I cannot really find a concrete consciousness to say, this is the consciousness of Namdak. But the mere collection of those moments of this experience of consciousness, I can say, okay, this mere collection, you know, we can use as a suitable basis to say, oh, this is the consciousness of Namdak, right? So that means merely imputed by the mind. Same with the computer, having all the different, you know, aspects assembled together in a particular way, yeah, when it's suitable to produce the things or the function we have right now, we can use, we classify it as a computer. But a computer, we cannot find a concrete computer in one, in one of the, you know, or in the chips or, or, or the screen, but a mere collection, we classify, okay, this is suitable to be labeled or called a computer. That's what it means, merely imputed by the mind. So that proves that things are interdependent. Because the mere collection 
of the parts of the computer are interdependent, and if they organize in a particular way, we say, okay, this will have a computer. Same for my consciousness, when it's you know, structured from particular time to particular time, we can say, okay, this is a stream of consciousness for the last one hour, 50 minutes, you see? So that proves that things are merely imputed, proves that things are interdependent. And how interdependent? The individual moments depend upon each other. The mere collection depends upon the individual moments. Right? As a computer, the collection of the computer depends upon the individual parts, and individual parts depends on the collection. And based when everything is gathered together in a particular way, we say, okay, this I label computer, this I label consciousness. So that's from a Buddhist perspective, kind of logic, or using epistemology. From a scientific point of view, same thing. That consciousness influences the brain or neuroplasticity, you can prove from many angles of behavior, aspects of science, or, or we just talked about uh, neurophenomenology. Right? So take, take it from the point of view of behavior science, take the, the aspect now, for example, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is a very you know, important thing because we have to wash our hands all the time, so is, is maybe something we can relate to. Yeah? So if you have, uh, this has been examined, right, that consciousness is not matter, right, and that's brain, physical brain, which has a correlation, there's a correlation between the two. But is there also causality? Well, that was not a part of the question, right? So the causality is there because a person with a severe OCD problem, there's a release of particular neurotransmitters that cause the person to wash their hands. There's no control at that time. The person just listens and does whatever comes to mind, right? No control. The self-awareness we just talked about is not present. The person just listens to the brain, does everything that the brain tells this person, yeah? So with mental training, in the fields of uh, Jeffrey Schwartz, very interesting personality. He did some research and he came to the conclusion that if you use what he calls the power of mental attention, you know, what we just talked about, kind of aspects of the mind to learn to, to, to put your mind in a particular direction, not to follow negative thoughts. So he came to a training and proved, basically, in his clinic, that it works. Meaning, uh, if people train their minds well, Right? to go to the garden instead of washing your hands, to try to produce all the thoughts than what the brain is actually telling you to do, then it looks like the person starts to change. That means there's first consciousness, mental activity, and then brain activity. Well, with an OCD severe problem, there's first brain activity and then consciousness. Intention, I have to wash my hands. From the other point of view, mental training, you actually change the brain, right? So there's a lot of things to say to this research, but we don't have enough time, but it proves the correlation to a certain extent between consciousness and brain activity. Correlation between consciousness which is not matter and a physical brain. And it's also true in the other research of, of uh, Richard Davison, we just touched upon these kind of meditators to prove these gamma waves beyond the chart. Right? So that comes from mental training that actually changes the physical brain. So the whole issue with neuroplasticity deals with these kind of issues, you know. By mental training, we can change the brain. Yeah, so there's a few points to that, but I hope it's not too complicated for a lot of people. Yeah. So uh, would, you, would you say that behavior, would alter, if you alter your behavior, your mm. brain will change? Yeah, yeah. An example from that is a very, very striking example. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, one of the famous actors, I always use this example because... He played a role in the movie called The Aviator. I haven't seen the movie, but I've seen the research. It's very interesting. He didn't have a OC, severe OCD problem before the screening. So he had to act in the movie as this patient, right? It's behavior. But behavior depends on intention. So he has to motivate himself. Oh, now I have to act like washing my hands. After a few months of screening, he got an OCD problem. Very interesting. By the power of his behavior, habituation. That's what we're talking about. So he got this OCD problem, which is a you know, problem in the brain, by the power of mental intention. So you can see it as first consciousness, then brain activity. Then he has this OCD problem, then the brain tells him to do something, he does it. So that's first brain activity, then consciousness. Then he goes to training, in this case, Jeffrey Schwartz, and he trains to get rid of this OCD with mental training. So there's first consciousness, and then change the brain again. Very interesting. Yeah.
fascinating. Yeah. There's, a, there's a very simple question here, um, okay. and that is, does desire, is it desire that creates objects? Desire create, creates how we perceive objects. Desire doesn't create the object. For example, you know, your object of desire, pizza or pasta or whatever, you know, or computer, or whatever is your object of desire, right? You just touch it a little bit, so when you see it on the screen in a nice color, right, you generate a kind of mental image, oh, I want to order this, right? So that mental image is not the pizza. That's just mentally created. Then desire builds up more aspects of this mental image, thinking, oh, if I have this, I will be so happy, right? That's what desire does. So then you get an object, and then the object is not the same as your mental image, so there's no satisfaction, you see? So that means that everything that's based on desire, strong forms of attachment, or strong forms of desire, which overestimates the qualities of a particular object, which is not present with that object, but only created by the mind in this mental image, which you believe that mental image is the object, right? Then when the object is met, which actually is the reality, then you get a bit kind of, you know, dissatisfied, because it's not as you expected, because you just had this wrong idea of this pizza or this pasta, which is just mentally fabricated, you see? So in that way, it, you know, our mind fabricates aspects of reality which doesn't abide with its object, technically speaking, or these fabricated aspects of reality are not with its object, it's just mentally created. And that's why it causes a problem. Yeah. Is it okay? Is it clear or not? Yeah, there's a very, very good question here, which is from um, Marianne de Bolt Morgan. Um, thank you very much for your talk. And can you say something about joy arising with deep experience, good humor, lightheartedness that the Dalai Lama embodies? Yeah. So, <laughs> when His Holiness was asked the question, you know, Your Holiness, you still look so healthy and, and, and bright, you know, being 80, 83 at that time. So then His Holiness said, he has two secrets, two secrets to keep him kind of, you know, bright, you know. And uh, one of the secrets is, he said, I make sure I sleep enough. <laughs> this is a very interesting comment, a very kind of down to earth comment. And the other comment is love and kindness. So if you practice, you know, that's, that's the logic behind it. If you practice an attitude that you see others as not even equal to yourself, but maybe even more important than yourself, because they're more in number and they all want happiness and don't want suffering. Like we ourselves have the same wish, so strong, you know. All others around us have exactly the same wish, wanting happiness, not wanting suffering. So this wish of two or three or four is already, people, is already so much more in number than just one, right? So if you think about all beings in the universe have the same wish, so if I can work for their purpose to accomplish happiness for beings, it generates a kind of good heart, as is one part of the question, which actually generates such a kind of strong mind, this is, this is kind of full of happiness, because it's such a positive thing, not for one person, not for two, but for countless. So that's one aspect from his holiness point of view. Another aspect from a scientific point of view is that Paul Ekman, one of the world leading personalities when it comes to facial expressions, he pinpointed down like 10,000 different muscular differences in the face. And he examined people in New Guinea, in New York, every human being on this planet, basically. You know, they're different cultures, not every human being, because seven billion is a bit difficult to examine all of them, but, you know, the, the different cultures. So when he met with his holiness, he said, I've never seen a face like that before. And that probably comes through what we just talked about. If people have this high level of gamma waves, they don't stick to emotions. They're so spontaneous, like writing in a river. You write and it goes. So with his holiness, same thing. With a trained mind, in that way, what we just talked about, you don't grasp or climb on to issues. You can let go, you see? So that means that uh, what Paul Ekman saw here is kind of a person, because we know, you know, uh, how we think expresses in the face. That's why for me, Zoom is very difficult. If people sit here, I can see if people are getting bored or, you know, falling asleep. or <laughs> You can see in the facial expressions the reaction of people, right? Now, I really have to look very carefully if people are either 
you know, not really paying interest or paying interest. <laughs> so it's difficult with Zoom. But facial expressions explain a little bit of our inner thinking, right? Emotions. So that's why it's a very interesting comment. Yeah. So there's this good hardness of, you know, feeling close to all sentient beings. And that brings this kind of incredible uh, positive state of mind that brings a lot of peace and happiness. Yeah. And you can feel it, no? Many people who are around this kind of beings who practice in that way, it has a kind of influence. Yeah. And it's also true for negative things. No? People who, who commit the act of, of murder whatsoever, this automatically when we see the news, it creates a kind of, oh, you know? But when we see something positive, it's kind of, oh, that's nice. So yeah, it has the influence of, of how we, yeah, how this goodness actually influences society as well. Yeah. Oh, Desmond, you mute, muted. I can't hear you. Desmond, you you muted. Mute now. Yeah, yeah, Am I okay yeah. now? Yeah, now you uh, now the Good. yellow line is coming again. Okay, yeah. lovely. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That was a very good answer. I mean, it is remarkable that he's always so happy and relaxed. And I mean, I must say, his happiness and relaxation is a thing that communicates, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. It's 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 amazing opportunity to communicate. Once, when his holiness is walking through a teaching. And because of, of being the head of state, he has the status in India, so there's security, right? So then one of the soldiers in India, they still have the rifles from the Second World War, kind of with the police. So they turn over the rifle and then, you know, they salute, right? So then in the salute, the soldier tries to stand as best as he can, but then in, in, in turning over the rifle, his watch drop on the floor. So he felt very uncomfortable standing there like this. His honest passes by, looks at his face, look down, see the watch, sees the watch, picks up the watch, puts it in the soldier's hand like this. The whole face of that soldier completely changed, you see? So that is just a very small act of kindness, you know, that actually transforms a human being. Very interesting, yeah. But it's not only true for his holiness, same with his birthday cake uh, example of, of this policeman in Maharashtra, right? It, that just one little act, or this BBC reporter who gave his shoes to this migrant who had to walk for 200 kilometers, right? It's kind of it does something to you, right? It's kind of, wow, that's nice. So that, with all those little things, we can, there's a possibility to change, even society. Yeah. Yes, it's a living example, isn't it? Yeah. It says, thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Um, has post-industrial society led to a change in the nature of the mind? distracting us from living in the moment and in the present? Yes. Easy, easy answer. <laughs> it's true, you know, because uh, people in, in modern times, it's more difficult for them to concentrate. You know, that's, we can see that uh, even there's a lot of research being done in, in people's in the offices these days that like 10 years ago or now, people are much more distracted. And one aspect, of course, is, you know, these kind of things we have over the internet can be very helpful, but can also be an incredible distraction, you know. And because of those distractions, the mind starts to get difficult to bring on control. Yeah, there's uh, another research, uh, yeah, I, just, I find it very easy to, uh, makes it clear to use this kind of findings in, 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 in the scientific world, is that they try to put people on a chair in a room with nothing. No phone, no internet, nothing on the wall, you know. So uh, for 10 or 15 minutes, the women did a little bit better than the men. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, there was a big number of people who couldn't sit still for 10 or 15 minutes. They prevented it. They, they actually rather choose to have a little distraction, like an, a little electric shock in the leg. You can't believe it, to not to deal with the mind. So that means if you have distractions all the time, you will never improve, right? So what we, just, what we just talked about, if you have a lockdown, you have an opportunity to reflect, an opportunity to change. If you're always distracted all the time, then you will never have an opportunity to reflect, can I have a better life with more value or not? Because things just happen to you, right? So that's why a lockdown can be quite interesting in that, that field of reflecting about things, yeah. And here's a very short question, but a very probably complicated answer to it. If the mind is also <laughs> interdependent, what part of the mind gets reincarnated? 
That's from Glenn Perkins. Yeah. So Glenn, uh, the the merely imputed mind gets reincarnated. <laughs> easy, easy answer. So that means that this stream of consciousness, right? There's no concrete consciousness as such that we can say, oh, this is consciousness. This is Namdak's consciousness. We cannot say that, right? So the mere collection of that moves forward, right? So the mere collection of this consciousness, which is individual, all of us have individual streams, that goes to the next life, right? So then at the time of death, a few factors play a role by, you know, activating kind of habituation patterns. That's what it is. It's just karma, you know, it's not that complex. It is a very complex thing, but it's not that concrete kind of law. You know, also that is momentary changing, right? So by the power of certain habituations, you're born in a particular place, right? In this particular same stream of consciousness. Yeah? So in the same thing, I also use other examples. If you have uh, if you want to change, like people in prisons, if you have a lockup system, like most of the prisons in, in the US and in the UK, unfortunately, also there's a lot like that. If you have just a lockup systems, but you don't do anything with the prisoners, they will never change. They fall back to the old habits after they come free. Right? So in this Holdorn prison in Norway, they have a completely different approach. So that means there's a criminal, then he trains his mind, right? continuity of consciousness, but there's a change. Then the next part of his life becomes much more positive. Because when they come out of that particular prison, there's only 20% that falls back to old habits. While in the UK, it's about 50 to 60, and the US is even higher. You know? So that means that from one period of life, you move to another one, and that you can change. You know? So that's also true when you fall asleep. You know? The way we think about things influences our dream. And when we wake up, when you go to bed for a very nasty, nasty feeling or being you know, irritated, then the sleep is not, a, is not very peaceful. You wake up with still this irritation. So the same continuity of consciousness happens at a time of death. Right? So dying is very similar. It's a bit more intense, but it's very similar. To, to, to go to sleep and have a dream, right? So we die, and then we go into Bardo and be reborn. Then we go to sleep, we have a dream consciousness, and then we wake up. It's very similar. So that continuity of consciousness continues, right? It is, doesn't exist from its own side. It's just a flux of moments. Conventionally, we say, okay, this, based on this mere collection, that's already classified as consciousness. So in a similar way as waking, dreaming, and waking up, in a similar way, we die in the immediate state and get reborn. Yeah, maybe that example helps a bit. Yeah. There's another question which is very similar, actually, and and that is from from Simon from Simon Eckert, I think it is. Um, what implication has the ultimate nature of the mind on karma and reincarnation? I think it's a it's a re, it's just really the same almost the same question, isn't it? Almost the same, yeah. So Simon, there's um, you know, karma plays a role, right? So we have karma and afflictions, the two things that cause us to be reborn in the cycle of rebirth or the cycle of samsara, karma and afflictions, right? So if you understand the ultimate nature of the mind, you prevent these afflictions from coming into being. Yeah, we just talked about the more you understand ultimate nature of reality, the destructive emotions, they lose their potential or their building blocks. Yeah, with the example of His Holiness, if you think about emptiness often, then it looks like afflictions don't arise. Right? So in that regard, from that point of view, this ultimate nature of the mind, understanding that well, helps us to reduce afflictions. If we reduce afflictions, we reduce negative karma from being created. If we reduce negative karma from being created, we reduce being born in negative states of rebirth, right? So that's one aspect of how we can, how this ultimate nature of the mind can help from the point of view of the afflictions. I just said afflictions and karma, right, causes us to be reborn. So afflictions we talked about. Karma can also be purified. Karma is not fixed, right? So uh, if you study the grounds and paths, the paths to liberation and enlightenment, in order to purify not only afflictions, but also their seeds or their potentials, yeah, together with creating new negative karma and purify negative karma of the past, we have to understand this ultimate nature of reality. So we have to move in that direction. And then we can stop this whole cycle of rebirths. 
if we have you know habituated our mind enough to this ultimate nature of reality yeah there's a question here which is i i, I hope i'm going to get the right sense of it mm. um, and how how does one balance this uh, this level of emotional development with our the, i assume the values of our society which can view such behavior as something to be taken advantage of yeah and which can lead to more suffering as people begin to view you as someone who can be pushed around or insulted <laughs> yeah. without any risk of you reacting <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah this question always comes up so i have the answer already ready in one of the chips you know so you just have to replay it and it comes you know, so it's true to practice patience right to practice love and kindness doesn't mean that you sit there and then everybody can do whatever they like. It's not like that. It's an action. You know? It's a very strong mind, actually. Yeah, it's, it's completely different from empathy, only feeling the suffering of others. It goes much further than that. You know? it's kind of, it goes a step further in the sense, I take action. For example, it's the intention that counts, right? The mental attitude that counts. We just talked about in the beginning of the talk. So in a similar way, a teacher or, or, or a father or a mother for the benefit of the students or the benefit of the children inside there can be strong compassion you know wanting to do something for them but sometimes you have to correct them right because if they, if they don't if you let them do whatever they like they it won't turn up to be good children everybody knows that right so that means we have to take action but if that action is based on patience the mind is calm the mind is cool so to say but we can say something, if you don't do your homework, if you don't do this, no dinner, or something like that, right? We can, we, can, we can say something with a good intention, though it has a strong impact on the child. But there's no anger involved, you see? That's the clue. We can act, but based on the positive intention. Then, that's the real kind of practice. Then we move forward. And that's true, uh, even for His Holiness. You know? If you see His Holiness, if you meet His Holiness in person, and you discuss a project, with His Holiness. His Holiness is very, very straightforward and asks you a question. What do you do if this happens? How do you deal with this? Very straightforward. Down to earth. Questions, answer, move forward. Very structured, very direct, but based on, you know, wisdom, compassion, thinking, clear thinking. Yeah. Uh, this is another very, this is a very uh, question which must be asked many times, but so it's worth asking again. <laughs> is desire a negative emotion? If desire is a negative emotion, it depends, first of all, how do you define desire? You know, you have to give a definition, you know, because we, as we define desire in, 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 in certain aspects of Buddhist psychology, might be different from the person who asked the question, how that person defines desire, right? So that's the first point. So we classify desire or attachment, so to say, as a mind that doesn't like to be separated from its object, but overestimates the qualities of its object, and it has the function of, uh, of bringing on clarity of the mind as well as uh, disturbance of the mind. So that's how we declassify desire or attachment. So if you see that definition, then you say, okay, that's not really something I like to generate in my mind, right? Because it overestimates the qualities of its object, which is not present with its object, as we just talked about this mental image creates a kind of reality that doesn't exist with the object. And that's why there's never satisfaction. Because if you meet that object in reality, you don't get those expectations as you had before. Because you overblew these kind of qualities, which are not with the object. It's just your mental imagination. If I have this, I will be so happy because of this, 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 and this, right? That's desire. Then when you're separated from that object, there's aversion. Because you don't like to be separated, you see? Yeah? And then on top of that, if you have a very strong desire or strong you know, attachment to obtain an object, your mind is occupied. There's no clear thinking. So that means the clarity goes and you cannot clearly think about things. So problem solving at that time is also not easy. Right? So that's if you, de if you define desire or, or attachment in that way, then we say that's what we call a non virtuous That would produce a suffering. If you say love and kindness, right? is kind of wanting to help others, yeah? Uh, if you classify that as a desire, that's a constructive way of thinking. So we have to be very clear in the definition, 
and then we can draw conclusions easier. Yeah. Mm. Well, this has to be the, but by the way, first of all, there's lots of thank yous from, from all the audience. Um, and so you can like or dislike, right? So <laughs> yeah, lots and lots of thank yous. I'd like to thank you kindly. Fabulous. And I'm so grateful. And uh, thank you very, very much. Very interesting. Yeah, that's, that's enough. Yeah, no need. Yeah, just, yeah. Thank you very much, <laughs> Keshe Namdak. And then here's one last question. Yeah. Please, could you recommend some further reading? It depends if you uh, recommending further reading. It depends if you're a good reader or not. And if you like this kind of books or this kind of books. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, generally speaking, on a secular level, right, uh, I find the books from Daniel Coleman very good. You know, it's not Buddhist, you know. Uh, that's this book of, you know, what's called uh, Emotional Intelligence, Healing Emotions. Very interesting books. Social and Emotional Healing. Yeah? So that's from the point of view of, of, of secular or universal aspects, right? Then from the point of view of more in the direction of, 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 of practice of spirituality, yeah, especially in, in Buddhism, then there's a lot of good books by His Holiness also, like talking about uh, anger, Right, there's books relating to that and talking about afflictions, how to deal with aspects, and how to, what we just talked about. If people are interested in, for example, uh, the ultimate nature of reality, then there's a book called See Yourself as You Really Are. A very small book for those who are not really readers, also by His Holiness. Very clear, very clearly explaining these points we just talked about. Yeah, that's for those who are more inclined to read more kind of Buddhist uh, yeah, related books. Yeah. There's many but, more, but yeah, that's uh, well, that, a start. That, that was a wonderful evening, Keshe. Thank you very, very much. Okay, thank you very and from, much. From us all, the Buddhist side here and from the audience, really, thank you so much, particularly at this difficult time. And yeah. hopefully we'll all be together again at 2 p.m. on the 4th of June. Yeah. Where we'll be talking about the environment, Buddhism and the environment. Yeah, true. Can I yeah. just really thank you for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Okay. Thank you so, so much. See you again, maybe you on again. Zoom or maybe one day we meet in reality. <laughs> yeah. The real, the real reality. <laughs> okay. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.